Hi everybody, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlamyTutors.com and in this video we're going to look at industrial cracking. Now industrial cracking is a very important process um, in the petrochemicals industry and it's actually used very very often in particular to make fuels and plastics. Um, now normally cracking is a process that occurs after fractional distillation so if you don't know what fractional distillation is then there's a video if you just click on the link just below uh, and you can have a look at the uh, process of fractional distillation. But we're just going to look at two types of cracking, which you need to know, which is thermal and catalytic cracking. We're going to look at the uh, conditions that's needed for both of them, and we're going to look at a bit of um, a bit of petrochemical chemistry as well. So we're going to start with what we mean by cracking. And I've written this up on the board at the top here. So basically, what we have is a short chain hydrocarbons. Um, that are actually really valuable. And short chain hydrocarbons, for example, around C7, C8, um, most of them are used for fuel. And the, ma the vast majority of crude oil dug out of the ground is used for fuels. So, and because when you dig out your crude oil, um, there's no um, certainty of how much of each fraction you're going to get. So, uh, quite often you might get a large amount of the long chain hydrocarbon, and that is an actually lower demand, uh, and not many people want it. So what we can do with it is we can take our long chain hydrocarbons and we can crack them, which means in fact we're just breaking them into smaller um, parts uh, which are in higher demand. So that's the key thing and that's what you've got to say if they ask in the exam why we do cracking. Um, and it actually allows you to make use of nearly every part of the crude oil and you're not wasting anything by doing this as well. So we're going to look at these two types here, like I say. So we're going to look at thermal cracking first. Now, thermal, is the, uh, thermal cracking, as the name suggests, obviously involves a lot of heat. So, um, thermal cracking, you need high temperatures, normally about 1,000 degrees Celsius. Um, again, this can change slightly, but it's around about there. The pressure is about 7,000 kilopascals, which is incredibly high pressure. Uh, and uh, actually, the products of this reaction is mainly alkene-based, uh, where you have a hydrocarbon with a double bond. So these are actually um, unsaturated hydrocarbons because they have a double bond that's contained in them. Now alkenes are very useful. Um, we normally use that for um, the manufacture of plastics through addition polymerization, um, which is obviously a, a you know plastics are are used everywhere. If you think about just looking around your home, uh, there's a lot of things that are made from plastics. So and this is most of them have originated from uh, crude oil. So we're going to look at the um, reaction that actually occurs here. So let's say if we take our hydrocarbon here, and I put R either side just to represent a like more carbons either side. Uh, we're talking about when we say long chain, we're talking about C20, C30 uh, around there. Maybe it's even C40 as well if it's long enough. So I can't fit that in there. So I've just put R just to represent um, more carbons that are on either side. Now when you do thermal cracking, because the temperature is so high, and um, that allows actually the the actual chemical bond between the two carbons to break. Uh, and when it does this, it actually forms these two, um, what we call free radicals here. And that basically means that you've got one electron that has gone onto this carbon and one electron in this bond that's gone onto that carbon. And we formed two incredibly reactive radicals. Now, um, you only need to know um, radicals um, um, regarding it for cracking, just regarding this. You don't need to know the actual mechanism uh, in relation to cracking. But you can see that we formed the two radicals there, um, and we've actually got two parts. Now, because we don't have a, um, a large amount of hydrogens um, that is left in this molecule, we have to form two products. And what actually happens is uh, one of the hydrogens, so let's say, for example, this hydrogen here would actually go along and join onto the um, other carbon on there to try and stabilize this molecule. Now, because this hydrogen has gone on here, then the electrons must actually jump on there to form a double bond. Again, you don't need to know the mechanism, but you do need to know the products and what you get from thermal cracking. So that's what I'm going to draw down now. So if the hydrogen was to come onto there, then what we have is effectively an R, two carbons with the hydrogens on there. And because the hydrogen from this molecule has gone onto there, we form that, which is your alkane. Uh, and then this side, because this has lost the hydrogen, to actually make sure that our carbons have four bonds each, what we must have is a double bond that actually fits in there to stabilize this molecule. So you'll form this. Uh, you put your R group on there. The hydrogen has disappeared from here. Uh, and then what you'd have is two hydrogens there as well. 
So you can see that, I'll just draw this in a straight away. There you go. So what you can see is you formed an alkene and an alkene. But this process mainly produces um, alkenes. It's uh, the, way, the way the actual molecule breaks up. You tend to form more alkenes than alkenes. So this is very useful for plastic manufacturing. And a typical question they may give you is they may say, they may give you a molecule like this, and they may say that this reaction is thermally cracked. Um, so we have C10H22, which is decane, uh, and they may say it forms um, octane, which is this one here. So that's C8H18, um, and you've got to form another product. Now what you're doing is you're basically adding up how many carbons do you have on the left, how many do you have on the right. You can see we've got eight here, we need another two to make up the C10 to make sure it balances. So we know we've got C2 on that side, and you can see we've got 22 hydrogens on the left, only 18 there, so the difference must be H4. Now C2H4 is an alkene, so this is what you would use to make uh, plastics. So for example, if this is ethene, you could form something like polythene, um, which actually uses um, ethene and joins it together to form a long chain. Now, that's good for plastics, but actually, um, a lot of the time, like I say, we're wanting to make um, uh, or crack long molecules to form fuels. Now, fuels, to make fuels, will have to use a different form of cracking, uh, and this is called catalytic cracking. Now, catalytic cracking actually has its advantages uh, and disadvantages over thermal cracking. Uh, one that it actually advantages is it's a lower temperature. A lower temperature means that it's, um, you're not burning as much fuel, so it's better for the environment from an environmental point of view and also from a cost point of view as well. This thing is a, is a good bit cheaper uh, if you have a, a lower temperature. The uh, lower pressure also, again, it's cheaper to operate something at a much lower pressure. In fact, the catalytic cracking is just above room pressure, so that's ideal. You don't even really need to pressurize it. Um, and what you actually form mainly from catalytic cracking are alkenes. Now, the downside with this is that um, actually you don't produce any alkenes. It's not beneficial for... Uh, raw materials to make plastics and also you need another ingredient obviously you'll need a catalyst uh, and the catalyst can be expensive and they can get poisoned as well which means the pores of the catalyst if it's a zeolite catalyst in particular can get blocked up so um, you do need to replace them and they can become quite expensive if you're using a very specialized type of catalyst so what we've got here and um, you might have done this in the lab um, and what you would have done is you would have um, taken a um, bit of mineral wool and you might have soaked that in a long chain hydrocarbon, something like uh, naphtha, for example, so C10 uh, or C15, somewhere around there. Um, and you might have used that to actually um, um, to crack it to form shorter hydrocarbon molecules. Now, what you would do is you would take a boiling tube like this, put it uh, horizontally like that, uh, and then you would put a catalyst something like aluminium oxide, for example. So I'll put heat on there. Um, and what you might do is you might heat up your catalyst, or this could be pot, porous pot. Um, so any type of uh, catalyst which might be in there, I'll just put that there, it's aluminium oxide, Al2O3, um, or it could be pot. So something that's reasonably porous. And this actually acts as a zeolite catalyst with pores in. And when you heat it up here, this starts to vaporize uh, some of the fractions from you start to um, actually change into shorter fractions. Uh, and actually what you can collect is some gas product that comes off on the side here. Um, now you can do this by using what we call an inverted boiling tube, uh, sorry, an inverted uh, measuring cylinder, uh, and we can actually collect it um, when it's filled up with water. Now, if we take this gas product and we add, um, we add bromine water to it, it actually decolorizes. So what that suggests is when you decolorize bromine water, that you've probably formed an alkene. Um, but what's left in here would be shorter chain uh, alkanes, um, which then could be used as a fuel. So, for example, something like petrol uh, or even LPG. And you might have some um, gaseous alkanes in there as well. But you have formed some alkenes as well. So this is obviously very useful for making a fuel. <clears throat> now, if we just come on to stick on the fuel bit here as well, um, catalytic cracking normally produces um, what we call branched alkanes, um, and branched alkanes are very useful for fuels, as we're going to see over here. So, in particular for petrol, petrols actually have an octane rating at the pump, and you might see, um, if you go to a petrol station, you might see a little number that's written down um, near the actual petrol pump, um, particularly for in leaded, you might see the number 97 or 98, uh, and that basically shows us our octane rating. 
And basically, the higher the octane rating is, the more efficient the fuel burns. And um, what you'll find is actually straight chain alkanes like heptane actually lower the octane rating. And the more straight chains you've got, um, the more likely you get something called knocking, uh, which happens in the engine. And this is where um, actually you don't need even a spark to actually ignite the fuel. It's just the, the fact when the piston actually squashes down on the fuel, that increase in pressure actually ignites the fuel on its own without any, without any form of spark. Uh, and because you can get that and then the spark comes in afterwards, you actually get a double um, explosion uh, in, your, in your piston. Uh, and that increases, that creates knocking uh, and your engine doesn't run as efficiently. It's actually quite juddery. So what they can do to get around this is they can actually increase the octane rating um, by having branched chain, um, shorter branch chain molecules. Um, and you can have cycloalkanes and arenes such as benzene. And actually having a petrol with a large amount of branched alkanes, cycle alkanes and arenes actually reduces that knocking effect uh, and actually increases your octane rating. So you'll find that um, um, the, the more of these you have in there, then generally the, better, the more efficient your fuel is. Uh, and uh, generally you would see somewhere around the 97, 98 um, percent mark, which is your octane rating, um, which is generally um, what's accepted um, as standard. But yeah, next time if you look out at the petrol station, look on the unleaded pump, you'll see a number that's written on there, um, and that actually tells you your octane rating. And basically, the closer to 100 that number is, um, the more efficient your fuel is. Um, I hope that helps. Um, that's it. Revise hard. Keep working. That's it. Bye.